Hello Brain Shakers, welcome to the Brain Shakers Academy, Brave Alice Days here. I'm excited today because I'm going to be sharing with you guys yet another interesting and exciting topic called fertilization, which is basically the process in which pregnancy is elicited or what happens in the background for pregnancy to then be elicited. Now before we even get into the nitty gritties of fertilization, it is important also to make mention that you should have looked also at the process of of sperm formation or spermatozoa formation and also the formation of the female egg and how it is ovulated and also look at the process of menstruation. Now I've done a couple of those videos on my YouTube channel you can find them which is Brain Shakers Academy and please when you get to those videos don't forget to leave me a thumbs up leave me feedback as well drop your comments in the comment section so I can know and get to hear what you think about them and also don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button so you're notified each time that I post something into that page. Now let's get right into fertilization and get to see what happens. Now, like I have already made mention that we need the spains and we need the egg, which is the female uh, egg or the ovum for fertilization to actually happen. Now a quick look at the applied anatomy before we get into uh, fertilization. So we have a diagram here that represents the uterus. This is the uterus. You have the fundus of the uterus. You have the body of the uterus. Somewhere around here is the cervix and then you have the vagina. Then you have the fallopian tube on the other end here. There is this region here. So this region is known as the conua of the uterus. And then as you move from the conua of the uterus you have the small end portion or the tiny portion, narrow portion here is called the isthmus and then from the isthmus you have the ampulla and then the ampulla you have the fimbriated end of the fallopian tubes and then you have the ovary and its ovarian ligament. Now as we're looking at this, this is going to help us in understanding basically what happens during that process. Now let's begin with after the process of ovulation has happened, so we have menstruation having happened, and around the 14th day in a normal or average or 28 day average cycle, you will notice that around the 14th day, the ovum is then going to be released. So you have an ovary here that will then produce an ovum. Now, this ovum that has been produced finds itself in the fimbriated end, which is the portion that is widened and closest to the ovary. Now, once it finds itself there, it has to move towards the area that is known as the area of fertilization. And we did mention that this is the isthmus. And we mentioned that this is the ampulla. Okay, now the junction in between the isthmus and the ampulla is known as the isthmic ampullary junction. Okay, so this ovum now that has then been produced has to be propelled towards that junction. So the larger portion of the fallopian tube, which is the ampulla, is the area where most fertilization would tend to occur closer or towards the isthmic ampullary junction. Now, this ovum or the egg is actually propelled to this region by the cilia. They are hair-like structures within the fallopian tube that then helps to push the egg forward towards the area of fertilization. And at the same time, the same fallopian tube has muscular regions secular muscles and longitudinal muscles around it that help also with the contraction effect to push the ovum towards that area. Now you have the ovum that has then reached the isthmic ampullary junction. The ovum is going to obviously be there and is only going to be there for a period of about 6 to 24 hours. Okay, within six to 24 hours, it is going to remain viable. Meaning that if coitus obviously happens prior to ovulation, that is, you have a higher chance of pregnancy being elicited. And if the, uh, uh, the sexual act happens 
after ovulation, it should be within the first to 24 hours to maximize the chances of pregnancy being elicited. Now, it is not just the timing that is going to determine whether pregnancy is going to be elicited or not. There are so many factors. Now, let's look at how the sperm is going to be transported to reach this region that we call the ampulla for fertilization to actually happen. So, there has to obviously be a sexual act which is uh, intercourse that is then going to deposit the spermatozoa in the vagina. Now, they there are so many ways now because of an improvement in research and also in a technology where we can facilitate fertilization outside of the uterus but then I'll do a separate video as I look at issues to do with infertility and some of the measures that are there to try and uh, tackle that but for the purpose of the understanding of today's topic which is fertilization we're going to use sexual intercourse as the primary mode of depositing spermatozoa that is going to come in and then fertilize. So once sexual contact has then happened, you find that the spermatozoa is going to be deposited right into the vagina. Now, as it is deposited within the vagina there, there's going to be about two to four meals, okay? Two to four meals of seminal fluid. Now, that seminal fluid is going to act as a buffering system, meaning it is going to help to neutralize the acid that is there in the vagina to make the environment conducive for the sperms to then find its way through to the cervix, the uterus, and then to the uterine uh, tubes, which is the fallopian tubes. So any spermatozoa that is then going to gain access through the uh, cervix, then will proceed through to swim through until it gets to the ampulla region. So for spermatozoa that will still find itself in the acidic environment, then it is going to be denatured. And spermatozoa would obviously stay in the spermatozoa for about 24 to 48 hours. That is within the vagina. But those that manage to get through to the fallopian tube because the environment up the uterus is a little bit more conducive than it is in the vagina, has the capacity to stay on an average of about three to five days. Some literature would even include uh, the 60th uh, day. So meaning that you could have coitus six or five days prior to the day of ovulation and the chances of a pregnancy happening would still be uh, present because the spermatozoa is still going to be viable when that woman does ovulate. Now, we have spermatozoa that has been deposited and some of it manages to gain its way through the thick mucus that is in the cervix there as an effect of a progesterone. What is then going to happen is that this spermatozoa that has been deposited here has to be directed on where to go. So meaning that the ovum itself is going to produce what we call chemotactic elements. Now, the chemotactic elements that are being produced are just signals that are being sent to the spermatozoa. So you are sending a signal to the spermatozoa to say the location of the ovum. So the ovum is actually here and it's sending those signals telling the spermatozoa to say, can you swim and come across to this area which is going to be our meeting point. So because the spermatozoa that has been deposited here has the principal piece of tail and has the end piece of tail and it has the mitochondria or the energy um, generating house there, then it will propel itself and move towards the ischemic ampullary junction for the process of fertilization. Now, once it gets to that uh, area, and even prior to get into that area, it comes into contact within this, um, its movement. It comes into contact with the cervical mucus, with the epithelial lining as well, and the environment that it goes through causes the spermatozoa to undergo a process that we refer to as capacitation. Now, capacitation just from the word itself, capacity, it means that the spermatozoa has to have the capacity to cause a pregnancy. 
So it means that as the sperm is then going to be moving, coming towards the ovum, there has to be some conformational changes that happen within this spermatozoa. So if you have this spermatozoa and we looked at it as a, having an acrosome, so as it has an acrosome, during the process of capacitation or as it's interacting with the cervical uh, mucus and the um, fluids within uh, the uterus, what is going to happen is that it will be forced to produce or release its uh, glycoproteins. Now, as it releases its glycoproteins, the glycoproteins are more or less like going to form something like receptors, meaning that once those chem chemotactic elements continue to come, it means there will be more direction that the ovum is actually on the end of the fallopian tube. So let's go this way. And so the spermatozoa then swims and finds the egg. And when it finds the egg there, what is going to happen is that this spermatozoa now will be forced to bury itself into what we refer to as the corona radiator. So we looked at what the ovum is and then around the ovum you have a zona pellucida, then you have the corona radiator. Now once the spermatozoa then comes and binds itself to uh, the uh, corona radiator, it produces an enzyme that we call hyaluronidase enzyme. Okay. So, the heterolonidase enzyme then is going to cause a conformation into the ZP3 and the ZP4. So, this is zona pellucida protein 3 and zona pellucida protein 4. And these are the ones now that are facilitating the attachment of the spermatozoa to the zona pellucida because we called this as the zona pellucida. So, this is going to facilitate the attachment or the binding of the spermatozoa to the zona pellucida. Now, once this attachment then has occurred, what is going to happen is is that the sperm again is going to release, okay, lysins, okay, it produces what is known as lysins from its lysosomes, and it also produces another um, enzyme which is acrosin, okay, which is a protease enzyme. Then, these two, what they're going to do is they will digest the zona pellucida. So they are digesting the zona pellucida for this spermatozoa to gain access into the cytoplasm of this particular ovum. Now, once they have digested and they allow the entry of this spermatozoa, what is then going to happen is what we refer to as a corticular reaction. Now, a corticular reaction is just preventing polysphemy, meaning that one ovum being uh, fertilized by a number of uh, spermatozoa. Because if you have, let's take for instance, two spermatozoa fertilizing one ovum, it means that you have a triploid number of uh, chromosomes, and that is not uh, uh, favorable for a human life. And so that fertilized ovum may not proceed through pregnancy. It may end up dying and being eliminated through uh, ap apoptosis. So what we are saying now is that once the, um, the male... Uh, spermatozoa, the spermatozoa has gained access into the cytoplasm of um of uh, uh, the ovum, what is going to happen is there are two things that are going to happen which will continue to prevent polysphemy. The first one we call it the first block. Okay, now the first block is basically going to happen by just the change of a membrane potential by sodium elements. Okay, so there is a balance usually between sodium and potassium, okay, on the membrane. So the sodium now is going to get into the cell with the invasion or with the entry of the spermatozoa. The sodium then gets into the cell. And once it gets into the ovum, it then raises the membrane potential from a negative to a positive. So spermatozoa can only bind to a negative um, uh, membrane potential. And once the membrane potential is risen to almost plus, that is about plus 20 millivolts or so, then it becomes difficult for spermatozoa to then come and bind to this. So the first block that is going to happen within the first minute is that there's going to be conformational changes on the membrane by causing an influx of the sodium into the cell and then a release of a potassium elements, making this a depolarized state and also changing the membrane um, 
potential and so there is no feather sperm that can bind or gain entry then the second one which is going to be the slow block the entry of the spermatozoa right into the ovum is then going to cause what is known as a corticular reaction like we mentioned so that corticular reaction is going to force the corticals the granules that are around the zona pellucida or the plasma membrane of the ovum they will get then attached to the plasma membrane and as they get attached to the plasma membrane there's also exocytosis of those granules into the perivitelline space now just on top of the plasma membrane you have another layer here which we call the perivitelline or the vitelline membrane now on top of the vitelline membrane there will be a space before you come to the zona pellucida and then the corona radiator so the exocytosis uh, process is going to push some of these granules into this space so that this now is hardened because there's already a spermatozoa that has entered there so this whole uh, part is then going to be hardened and at the same time it also uh, elicits uh, some enzymes no uh, um, some enzymes that are going to then be produced there will cause the uh, zona pellucida proteins that bind to the spermatozoa to change their state so that they can no longer bind to any spermatozoa that is coming and this is how it is going to prevent the process of polysphemy now once all this has happened and we have an ovum that has a a male pronucleus in there the nucleus of the ovum would then condense and then fuse together with the, the male um, uh, spermatozoa uh, uh, which is the, the male pronucleus will fuse with the female pronucleus and then you end up having what is referred to as a zygote now once you have a zygote it means that the process of fertilization has been completed it means that fertilization has gained access into um, so you have the uh, the spermatozoa having gained access into the ovum then you have fertilization and the zygote it is the zygote now that is going to continue the process of cleavages that is undergoing mitotic divisions to produce then the human being which is obviously a, uh, another topic uh, that we look at when we look at embryology so basically that is what happens uh, for fertilization to occur so oftentimes people uh, would refer to the process of fertilization as a complex process yes it is a complex process but that is the basic understanding about the formation of the zygote so there has to be a spermatozoa that has the capacity to then fertilize the ovum and the ovum itself should have the ability to send messages to the spermatozoa to then move towards its direction for further um, uh, processes and for fertilization to be uh, complete so it is not just the number of times uh, that one has a sexual intercourse for fertilization to occur and it is not the duration of the sexual uh, intercourse but it is the ability of the ovum to send those uh, signals and the ability of the spermatozoa to swim and have the same glycoproteins that we're talking about and be able to penetrate through the ovum so the ovum is a well-guarded cell and so the spermatozoa should have the capacity within it to then go through those uh, layers and then be able to cause a pregnancy so if a spermatozoa is not capacitated it doesn't have the power within it then fertilization is not going to happen so briefly that is what happens in the process of fertilization now if you have liked this video and you have found it helpful in understanding what happens through the process of fertilization please give me a thumbs up give me uh, uh, leave me some comments in the comments section i would like to hear what you think and also please don't forget to subscribe to my youtube channel brain shakers academy and as always it's a pleasure to have you around and i will see you in the next one